when we look at the French elections, do you think Macron has overplayed his hand by calling early elections? Yes, it's a massive strategic miscalculation. Uh, he didn't need to call an election in three weeks. He assumed the left would not organise, they did. And he assumed that Project Fear would ultimately work to deny the uh, far right a majority. Now, there will be a lot of tactical voting. We've already seen that on Sunday. That will probably prevent Le Pen from delivering a majority. But she will go from 88 MPs to more than 250, according to some polls. So this is a major increase in her representation in the Assembly. Macron centre will be squeezed. They go from 250 to probably less than 100 or maybe a bit more. And you've got a deadlocked parliamentary uh, outlook with no ability to form a government, pass legislation, uh, move big files, whether domestic or foreign, forward. So it's a major miscalculation. It's a, a very strong, I think, signal that Macronism has been thoroughly repudiated by the electorate. And you're left now, I think, ultimately with an enfeebled president, a delegitimized president, a deadlocked assembly with no capacity to act in a kind of half-life caretaker capacity, a very high risk of another election in a year's time, and Le Pen in pole position to sweep both the Elysee and the assembly in 2027. It's a major strategic miscalculation. How close Le Pen is to Kremlin, do you, how do you think? I mean, they're close. Um, Le Pen is doing what she can to distance herself, um, but intellectually, ideologically and even financially, uh, these parties have been very close in the past. I suspect Le Pen would try and implement an Orban type agenda at the European level, so she would push for peace. Uh, the way in which that would happen would be primarily, I suspect, by starving Ukraine of financing and the weapons it needs to fight the war. Um, and would be willing to do a lot of Vladimir Putin's bidding, recognition of territories that have been annexed since the invasion, uh, supporting an outlook that uh, keeps Ukraine neutral and doesn't enable NATO accession. She'd be a major opponent of Ukraine joining the EU, a major opponent of more fiscal financing. A Le Pen majority, whether in Parliament or indeed at the, the Elysee Palace and in Parliament, is a major strategic problem for the European Union in its ability to support Ukraine long term. Uh, but do you see there's a g general sort of tiredness with uh, in the West in supporting Ukraine because the war continues and we don't really see how it's and when it will end? I don't think there is electoral fatigue. I don't think there is political fatigue. I think if you look at what Europe is doing, uh, the support for Ukraine is fairly robust. Uh, there is the commitment to keep financing the state and the war effort. Uh, uh, the EU and the G7 now collectively will stand up an additional 50 billion in financing for Ukraine at the end of this year using Russian frozen assets and the profits they are generating uh, to support more money to be sent to the front line and for Kiev. Uh, there is a commitment to bring Ukraine into Europe. There is a commitment to support Ukraine militarily. Uh, lots of member countries have been negotiating bilateral security guarantees. And so if you look at that entire uh, mosaic, actually, the support is quite robust. The big concern, of course, is the longer term, not the near or medium term, but the longer term outlook is challenging, especially if Trump wins the presidency on the 5th of November and he withdraws support. So what, that, what does that then do to Europe's ability to backfill and to backstop and to come in and compensate for what the Americans were doing if they no longer want to do the things they were doing? And that I think that complex, that picture becomes a bit more challenging in light of what we're seeing in France. I don't, I don't think there's fatigue. I do think there is a lot of unity on the Ukraine question, but there is no doubt that the ability to sustain support longer term is becoming more challenging. But if Americans pull out or partially pull out, they are already saying that Europe is not doing enough uh, on, on, on the European side to help Ukraine. Can Europe really live up to the expectations? It depends how one defines expectations. I mean, Europe is already spending a lot more of its GDP on security and defence and on NATO. Some countries are two, two and a half. Poland will be close to 5% of GDP next year. Uh, there is a commitment at the highest levels of the EU to do more for its own security and defence. That's 
partly being driven by what Trump may do. This is a big central element of von der Leyen's mandate uh, to reinforce Europe's security, to do more on the border states with, to do more with and for those countries which border Russia to potentially agree to an EU iron dome to stand up more collective financing for Europe to mobilize and be more secure and more coherent Um, but yes I mean there is a major question about Europe's capacity to act um, in opposition to the stance the US may be articulating and to substitute for the support the US provides and I suspect on the military side uh, the European Union will not be able to backfill if the Americans withdraw military support. On the financial side, uh, there is appetite for the Europeans to keep financing Ukraine, but that will probably not be the war. It will be for things like post-war reconstruction, rebuilding the economy, attempting to integrate Ukraine into Europe. But on all of those questions, again, I think what's happening in France is deeply unhelpful. And this is what's interesting about Macron. You know, he's been a, a very strong agitator and believer in a strong France, a strong EU and a strong France and strong Europe supporting Ukraine and yet the gamble he's now taken arguably undermines both France and Europe's ability to support Ukraine and that is what is so frankly surprising and disappointing about the gamble Macron took. Now in the recent elections in Europe we see that the whole Europe is moving towards the right. How concerned should we be Will that bring about big change? I wouldn't agree with that characterization. I think if you look at the el- results of the European election, um, actually the broad story was the centre held very firmly. Von der Leyen has a very large governing majority in the European Parliament from which she can draw and continue to pursue a centrist agenda. That will enable her to govern, I suspect, from the, from the centre as she did over the last five years. So that's a good story. That being said, you are seeing in specific countries a movement further to the right. France is the most recent example, the Netherlands a bit before. IFD in Germany, correct, but some of their momentum has now been arrested and I suspect there is little or no likelihood uh, they can form part of a governing coalition at the federal level. There will be such major political and public opposition to that. Um, but but I do agree that you are beginning to see a combination of countries at the European level, Hungary, Slovakia, Austria, the Netherlands, potentially France, that have more FA right-leaning agenda, that have an anti-European agenda, that arguably creates more challenges over the medium term. I don't think one can extrapolate that trend and 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 make a very general or firm argument that the whole of Europe is lurching to the right because that's not what the results of the European elections tell us. They suggest that in some countries the challenges are quite acute, but there is still a very large centrist majority. That was the that was the clear conclusion from the European elections, albeit there are very particular challenges in key member states. But wouldn't you say that Europe is becoming more conservative? Look at the government in Italy, uh, also in Spain, uh, more conservative forces are doing uh, uh, well, just depending how far on the left they they are starting, but everybody is moving towards being more conservative. Yes, Yes, I don't necessarily disagree with that characterization, and I think the big driver for the far right's performance in Europe typically is related to migration and cost of living issues. And migration is the very difficult and challenging issue to resolve because it requires solutions that are cross-border. It requires the cessation of sovereignty to the European level to ultimately address what is a collective action problem. You can't address migration as a single individual state. You've got to do it either bilaterally or in uh, the form of a collective and agreeing to a very robust um, reform of the EU's immigration and asylum system is proving very challenging because member states are very opposed to giving up those kinds of powers to the European level. So migration, I think, will remain a driver for the far right. The economic outlook that remains challenging will also remain a driver that supports the far right. Now, ultimately, where the governments are formed, that are fundamentally rightward leaning, that has a major impact on the political and policy agenda of the EU, there I think we need to be a bit more careful uh, because... 
typically what you do see happen is more fragmented governments emerge that aren't really capable of taking forward movement on any given issue. So the Dutch administration is a good example of that, may have a similar instance in Austria later in the year as well. Now with Macron weakened and Olaf Scholz not really very strong, don't the UK regret that you are out of the EU because now you would be the leading power? Those um, those parts of the electorate that are pro-European and those parts of the political establishment that are pro-European absolutely will see this and absolutely accept this hypothesis. And I think they will be of the view that if the UK were in the EU today, uh, the UK would likely be leading the EU off today. Schultz is not a strong communicator. He's not a strong chancellor. He sits on top of a very fragmented three-way coalition that is in disagreement across all major political and policy areas. The economic outlook is very challenging. It's highly unlikely he'll be re-elected. Macron is obviously in a very weakened situation in light of the outlook now for the Assembly and what's happening in Parliament. So in that context, with the majority that Starmer's about to deliver, that would enable more leadership at the European level. But of course, Starmer would probably not exist and the majority he's about to deliver would not exist were it not for Brexit. Thank you.